Hello, and welcome to a near-miss episode of the Enterprise Linux Security Podcast. I'm here as always with Chow. How are you doing? All good, Jay. As always, a pleasure. Good to be back after this vacation period. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about what is likely going to be the the most impactful cybersecurity story of the year, and it's still April. So yeah, uh, get ready. This one is really, really big. Well, we started talking about some of these, not this, obviously, but much, much lower level things in the past. And we would say things like, this is only going to get worse in the future. I kind of wish we can go back and find the first time we said that and then kind of like mirror it to the situation. But of course, we're talking about the XE fiasco as the title of the podcast is we had a, as someone in our chat room put it, a near miss. So that's uh, perfectly stated near miss, whereas something could have ended up in Linux distributions that would have represented a backdoor, although it did find its way in some some places. It didn't find its way into pro, you know major production distros, correct, Chow? Yeah. There's, there's, there's nothing there. So um, we'll talk about what could have happened. And even though we're talking about what could have happened, this is huge because it almost did. So we need to really understand what almost happened and why this is such a big deal and uh, just basically unpack the story. And you also wrote an article that we need to plug. So we'll have that in the uh, description as yeah. well. It's on the, the TechScare blog. I usually post my content there. So if you guys want to check it out, we'll have the link available. But if you look for a deep dive on the XE compromise, you'll find it there. Um, so yeah, the, the story is, I mean, amazing for all the wrong reasons and some of the right ones as well. Um, it touches on lots of different things like open source and supply chain attacks and uh, the distros picking up software from different repositories and implicitly trusting it. There's a whole bunch of layers that we'll try to peel back on this. So let's start with the way that this was caught, which was remarkable and people are started paying a lot of attention to the story precisely because it happened this way. At the end of March, um, probably the last week of March, something like that, like two weeks ago, um, this this engineer at Microsoft called Andreas Freund, and apologies for butchering the name, totally not intentional, but this Microsoft engineer, he was trying to do some measurements on some Linux VMs that he had. He was trying to establish a baseline for some unrelated task, and he started noticing that the SSHD, the secure shell, the daemon process, was taking almost half a second before returning a response, um, regardless of a, a connection attempt being successful or not. So it was 500 milliseconds more than he was used to seeing on other boxes. And he started looking into what was causing that. And mm -hmm. as he has made abundantly clear on some, some public comments that that person has made, um, this was pure luck that he caught it. He just happened to be looking at the right time, looking at the, the measurements and finding that weird. So keep in mind that everything from this moment on, on this story, happened by blind sheer luck. Everybody was just lucky enough for this to have happened this way. There's he's a, That person's a hero as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, he's your you know? everyday hero right now. He's a hero. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> um. And we'll, we can start just by that. People are always hang up on open source and how being open lets everybody revise it and that it's secure because it's open because everybody can look at the code and make sure that there's no nothing there. And this was deployed on a public repository and nobody noticed it. Okay, Just because the code is open by itself does not mean that it's more or less secure than anything else. Being open in this specific case, actually helped the bad guys because they could see the code. They could see exactly what they were trying to hit and they could code specifically to that to that place in the code so that it would cause the most harm. There's there's an analogy. I don't know. I've I don't know if I've ever published this online or not, but I collect Lego sets. It's okay. a hobby that I have. It's um, a pretty cool hobby. Some of those things are absolutely jaw dropping what they create with those. <laughs> I cannot disagree with that. Um, there are events around the Lego hobby and there are conferences and there are gatherings and all of that. And something that usually happens at those gatherings is that there's a blind build 
where people are sat around the table and they are given a non-transparent bag and inside is a set all the pieces to build the set and you're supposed to build it without looking at the pieces and the oh. person that manages to build the set will win a given prize and every now and then somebody manages to feel to complete the set correctly and wins the prize but most often than not people just end up with something strange and right. obviously not what they were intending to create and this is perfectly mirrors what happens with open versus closed source when you have the instructions for something, when you're able to look at what you're building, it's much easier to create what you're trying to create. When you're mm -hmm. just going by feel, when you're just seeing what happens when you tweak this and tweak that, in the case of a closed source project, sure, sometimes you might get it right and you might compromise the application, but other times it's harder to do for that closed source application than it is for open source. Please don't misunderstand me here. I'm, I'm not dissing on open source. It's an absolutely great way to, to handle projects, not just code, but it's an absolutely great way to handle projects. But necessarily because it's open source doesn't mean that it's more secured or less secure than closed source. And absolutely. You, and this has been touted, like, oh, this is a success of open source. We caught it because it's open. Really? Is it? really why you caught this why we dodged the bullet on this one because it sure doesn't feel that way going yeah. back to that to that microsoft engineer so the person caught the 500 milliseconds delay and he started debugging the the sshd process doing that he noticed that there was an intricate series of dependencies and more on that later where libel zma was adding some behavior to the calls on sshd and those calls, either because they were poorly implemented or because they weren't optimized, were adding that delay. And he proceeded to further analyze that and he realized that that was a backdoor code. We now know yeah. that, like a few weeks after the fact, that that code in particular is actually expecting a specific key during the, the negotiation phase of the SSH login. And when he sees that key, it will accept remote commands and execute it on the local system. Okay, so that's the backdoor. It's, it triggers on a specific key sent by an attacker and then accepts commands from that attacker. That's the backdoor and that's what everybody could be running right now on their systems if this hadn't been caught the way that it was. And this happened on Libel ZMA and it was tracked down to Libel ZMA. Libel ZMA is a component of XZ Utils. XZ Utils is a compression uh, package that gives you compression for your projects. It's also one of the options that you can use to compress the kernel images and the init RD and all of those components of the kernel. And I just did a test this morning. I deployed the Anomal Linux 9, for example. Um, and sure enough, even the minimal install will drop XZ on it. It drops SSHD and it drops XZ. So you have all the components necessary to trigger this backdoor, even on a minimal installation. It's not something that just happens if you have this and this and that particular set of packages. Minimal installations would trigger this. And that's mind-blowing. It, it is mind-blowing. And, and the near miss is mind-blowing. Um... <clears throat> I think your Lego analogy works really, really well because, you know, usually you have someone who will build something amazing if, if they do. And then, you know, it's their project and then someone else comes along and they're like, hey, I want to help with that, too. That looks pretty cool. I like what you're doing. I want to help out. And they do. And then but it's, it comes to a point where, where the project is so big, you have to have more people helping because it just gets too big for one person. And at some point. You know, I'm, I'm assuming the first thing somebody thinks about when someone wants to contribute and offers their time, they're like, well, yeah, I'm overwhelmed over here. Of course, I'll let you help me out. Who am I going to be to turn down any help? Uh, it is just um, when you have a small project and then, you know, lots of people are depending on this. And with the code being opened, it's, it's almost like building a Lego set out in the open. But you, if you want to join it or join the project, it's one thing to show up after it's already created. You have to know how it works. You have to, you can't just like start writing code. You don't even know where to put the code. You don't even know where the files are. You don't even know like what the, you know, correct. Uh, every project has certain mannerisms that they want. There's, there's things to learn. You have to learn this stuff. And then um, you have to learn how it's built. And then you could go ahead and, and deploy. So when something's open source, it's, 
it's either you're there from the beginning or you're there at the end. You have to unpack it, understand how it works. And then apparently for someone to put a back door into that project. And it was, it, it's so, I need to underscore how close this was. This could have been in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It could have been in SUSE. It could have been Debian, Ubuntu. And it made it into development versions of, of some of those too. So it almost did. That's pretty crazy. It made it into Fedora 40 Beta. It made it into Fedora Rawhide. It made it into Debian and Stable. It actually made it into a release of Gparted. So if you have the Gparted image that was built around mid-April, you have a compromised XZ there and you have a compromised SSH there. Um, they released the new Gparted ISO uh, yesterday or two days ago, uh, which you should download and delete the other one. Um, but as soon as people realized that um, the backdoor was there and was in XZ, it came from the XZ package, we started rolling back the, the tape. And st we started rewinding the tape and started to try and identify when did the backdoor get added to the codes? How did this all happen? Why nobody caught it? And there are so many interesting aspects to this. So let's take it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. XZ was a one-man project. It started around 2009 by the person who created LibLZMA, uh, Lasse Collins, I believe is the name of the, the author and still the maintainer. And as most successful one-man projects out there, everybody knows a few, uh, we've talked about a few in the past, at some point, the burden just becomes too much. Like you were saying, it's difficult to keep track of all the commits. It's difficult to keep track with user requests and fixing the bugs and tracking all the mm -hmm. issues. And then you have requests from the distributions that need your package to be in a certain way that you haven't prepared yet and you need to do it. There's all of these requests that come to successful projects that make it really tricky for one person to handle everything. And this right. is true for every single open source project out there. This wasn't particularly special for it. This was just special because it was so prevalent. And again, from the moment that the Linux kernel starts to accept XC as an acceptable format for compressing the kernel, all the distributions will follow suit and will include it. It's just the highest compression that you can get to the kernel image. So it favors the distribution. It favors the minimal size of the of the kernel. And that always helps. So all the distributions picked it up. Mm -hmm. And that's great for the project. It means that it's more widely available. Um, so there are other projects like this. There are other projects that are just as critical like this one. It just so happened that this one was severely understaffed. That's just one person maintaining it, even 10 years after it became successful. So right. the whole operation that got the code into the XC repository started over two years ago. Keep that in mind. To get compromised code into the repository, someone or some group or some organization planned a two year long, at least two year long operation that followed the series of steps. First, they gained trust from the maintainer. Then they managed to be accepted as a commit reviewer, then as a committer themselves, then got privileges to accept the commits themselves and review and accept them. And then basically became the maintainer as well, co-maintainer, if you so want to call it that. And building trust in an open source project it's not specifically hard. It's not something that, oh, how am I going to achieve that? You start by committing some basic stuff. You start by making a suggestion here and there. You start by complementing the author, by sending in a simple patch or two, a one-liner fix, something like that. And the attacker, who goes by the handle Jietan, uh, supposedly a Chinese-sounding name, Chinese-related name. Again, this is just a handle anybody or any group of people can be behind that handle. And more than likely, it's a group of people. Mm -hmm. But through this handle, they managed to gain the trust of the committer. And here is where things start to, to be interesting. Mm -hmm. After a few successful commits and a few contributions that were accepted normally and are deemed to be innocuous still to this, still today were not found to be malicious, is what I'm trying to say. After that, there started to be some pressure from new accounts on the on the mailing list of the project. Oh, you're taking to to the to the original maintainer. 
oh, every commit is taking too long, you're not paying attention, why are you doing this, the project is dead, there are still, uh, there's a long queue of uh, things that you haven't addressed yet, we need this bug fixed and we need that bug fixed, and the pressure started to mount from quite a number of different accounts, which turns out only appear when it's necessary for pressure to be made into making something that the attackers want. Those accounts, and this is true for everybody, how hard it is to be on the internet today and not, ha not have your email be part of uh, a data dump somewhere. Krebs from mm -hmm. Krebs on Security looked up the email addresses from where the pressure came and none of those addresses was found anywhere else on the internet. I mean, mm -hmm. my personal email account, my work email account has been found in I don't know how many dumps and I had to change my credentials. I don't know how many times just because of that. The email accounts from where the pressure came, nowhere. The only existence right. that they have is that precise time that they started adding up with comments like, you really should have somebody else helping you out. You can handle the all the workload. And through that peer pressure, through that making the project look worse than it was and making the, the maintainer look more unresponsive than he actually was, they actually got the maintainer into accepting that person that was submitting the patches as a reviewer and then as someone with privileges. And that's how he gained um, privileges into the into the repository and into the project himself, itself. And just that step alone, that takes preparation, that takes coordination, probably between different people, that takes months in preparation because you have to have the, the patches that you submit have to be spaced out in time. It's not like you can come one day and, hey, here are 10 patches, now trust me and give me access to the project. That's right. not exactly how it happens. This happens over time, it builds over time. And the level of preparation that went into this operation, boy, it sure does say that there was a lot of effort here. Yeah, I would say so. And and this is one we know about. I guess the elephant in the room that I'm too scared to even mention, and, or but I have to say it, is, you know, it, it's, it's just kind of shines a spotlight on something that could very well happen. And as much as I hate to say it, probably eventually will. I mean, because it seems like there's repeated attempts to try to do things like this. Maybe not quite the same kind of thing, but similar enough that it just, I just feel like we need to really have our eyes open right now. Because this okay, is so one that didn't make it. So this, this is the one that we now know happened and we now know right. how it happened. Yep. Pressuring. Again, this is typical of open source projects. Pressuring someone that is working unpaid on their own free time, doing something that they like, into doing something, whatever it is, either working faster, releasing faster, releasing some feature that you want, just pressuring in any way, it's not acceptable. Shouldn't be acceptable no. in any project. If you have something that you want added or something that you want, you want to change in a project, suggest it and Stop trying to add pressure on it. First, because right now people are going to be alert to it and you're basically going to be ignored or just outright refused. And secondly, because now that we know that this is a tactic that worked, people are probably going to look back into commit histories and they're probably going to look back in different projects and see, hmm, I wonder why the hell somebody and so many people were complaining that that feature wasn't implemented yet and then it was. And right. yeah, that might be fishy. Okay. Yeah. This was the one we caught. Again, by sheer blind luck, this was the one we caught. I cannot stress enough how lucky we were there. You guys had an eclipse that you could see on the US like a few days ago or yesterday or something like that, mm -hmm. where every single line perfectly for the passive totality being there. Every single line just perfectly for us to caught to catch this one when we did. Right. Again, if it had slipped for a week, two weeks it would have made it to the repositories where it shouldn't. It would have made it to the actual uh, distributions. And it would have yeah. started being being distributed through the regular patching process or through new versions being deployed. So um, here we have a project that was created and you know gives us a very valuable result, compression. It's pretty good. I mean, we can't, can't argue with that. And I mean, we just get this amazing thing and 
I'm sure this person didn't know that it was going to become as popular. I mean, I think we always have an idea that it could, but no one, I mean, there's so many projects out there that don't get popular. Who's to say yours will? And then it does. It gets really popular. Next thing you know, it's in distributions and it's a critical part of Linux distro architecture here. And after all of that, after getting popular and rising up and getting popular, it's still a small project. Even after being dependent on that much by so many different distributions, um, these projects are often starving and we don't realize that because we think of it, not us, obviously, or anyone listening to this podcast, but we think of it, ooh, something new and a new toy to play with. Here's XC. Let me uh, play around with this and see how it works. It's it's like in Linux, you're wrapping, unwrapping Christmas gifts all the time. It's like you get this project and you get this, this binary and that binary. Look at this cool tool. Look at that cool tool. Oh, look, a new desktop environment. That's great. But then these things get so popular and we don't really stop to think like, are they okay? Like we're, we're taking all these things, but we're not saying, are they okay? I mean, what does a project look like? Um, if a business is, is using XZ and it's saving them a bunch of money, I, I don't know. Are they giving back? I don't know. And, and with the small team, it just, I'm not saying anything was justified, but what I am saying is if it wasn't such a, you know, all these projects starving like they are, maybe they'd be more likely to catch these things and it wouldn't be such a surprise that they did because I'm surprised they caught it. You said that you we don't know. We actually have some inkling on it. Last mm -hmm. week, the FFmpeg project, they posted on Twitter that Microsoft had approached them about a new feature that they wanted in FFmpeg, and they were asking when it would mm -hmm. be done. And it was something that they needed for Teams. Okay, So Microsoft uses FFmpeg implicitly, and they part of Teams, and they use it for video encoding or whatever. It doesn't really matter. And right. the authors came back, the authors, the, the maintainers on FFmpeg came back and they say politely, I don't know if it was politely or not, but they asked Microsoft for a, a support agreement or some payment that they would make them on a monthly basis or a yearly basis or something like that. And Microsoft in return offered them a couple of thousand dollars, one time only payment. Oh. For a project of the magnitude of FMPEG that Microsoft itself relies on for multiple applications and multiple projects. That's Even if a small business it. like mine just gave them a thousand dollars, that'd be an insult for a for a donation, especially when it's that required for virtually everything on when it comes to media. Yeah. That's it's it's an, so, I mean it's huge. And that's FMPEG, which has a presence in basically anything that touches on multimedia or audio or video or whatever out there. And if that project is like that, we can sure take a, a wild guess on how the others are doing. Not great. Um, right. Okay, so we have this person that gained trust and made this way into the into being a maintainer on XZ. So how did he actually got the backdoor code into there? From what we know, um, he started simple. A, a project like that, when it's built for a distribution, uh, and this is a detail that sometimes escapes people, when a distro pulls the code from a repository and builds it into a package of their own, they don't exactly follow the same steps and use the same tool chain as you use when you git clone a repository and compile it yourself. There are a few differences there in, in which you have to add branding to the package, you have to add some, um, I don't know, documentation, the, the links have to be in the right place. There are some extra steps there. And mm -hmm. this attack was planned and the code was created in such a way that it would only trigger in the code path specifically for distributions. If you pull the code from the repository and you built it yourself and you observe the results, you wouldn't get the backdoor. That had two effects. First, it immediately means that it was specifically targeted at getting the backdoor into specific distributions. Mm -hmm. um, it requires glibc, it requires systemd, and it requires sshd being deployed. This this actually narrows it down to Red Hat based distributions, to Debian based distributions like Ubuntu, for example, and Mint and all the others. And but narrowing down is the, is this an oversimplification because those distributions account for the majority of the deployed systems out there and for the majority of the Linux systems out there. Um, oh, yeah. So. Again, not having been caught when it was, it would have made it into all of those deployed systems and into deployed systems that go in effect in the future. That's as big as it can possibly get. And right. by going through that specific code pass that only triggers when the distributions are building their packages, it makes it harder for security researchers and for 
people looking at the code for different packages to actually find the, the backdoor because it won't be there on the stuff that you pull. Okay. So if you're a security researcher, if you're trying to, I don't know, if you're trying to go over the code and make sure that it's clean, it's safe, you won't see the, the bad code. You won't see the malicious files because those would only get pulled through the other tool set. And that immediately makes it harder for security researchers to find. Again, yeah, so they thought of some things that, yes, definitely yeah, not an accident. Not an accident. This, again, this was something that was well sought out, not something that your average hacker in a hoodie on a darkened basement would come up with on an inspired day. This was something that took a lot of effort and preparation. Another interesting detail is that that person or that group of persons behind the G10 handle, the Again, the internet being what it is, when this story broke, everybody started looking at the, the smallest details. And one of the details that people looked at was the commit history, and specifically the times of the commit history. And they were following a 9 to 5 schedule. So most of the commits by these people were done in a 9 to 5 schedule, which immediately begs the question, okay, who is paying the salary of that person? Who is the organization that's paying him to do that from a 9 to 5 job? Because yeah, again, probably not what they're supposed to be working on. And if it was what they're supposed to be working on, it's even more egregious. So because that it's means it's likely option delivered. number and two, and it already was. Yeah, it's likely option number two. Yeah. Okay, so yep. the back door itself is comprised of a couple of different moving parts. There, um, like I said initially, the code that they were trying to compromise that we know of again. The part about that we know of is specifically important because we might not have fully understood the the entire part, the entire code of the backdoor. The backdoor itself, the code, and again, this is highly complex. There was a part of the script, of the build script that the distributions used that would pick specific characters from inside a couple of binary files. And it would pick a character at one address, and then 8,000 addresses ahead, it would pick another, and then at, at another position, it would take another, and it would compose that into a piece of code. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like the code was out in the open in the binary files. First, because they were binary, so you wouldn't understand them immediately because they were basically garbage. They were binary files that that person had added as a test case for the libelzma process to make sure that it would fail if it found a bad file and it would do an uncompression correctly if it found the correct file so that person submitted to binary files there <laughs> and he went so far as into the commit message when he added those two files adding oh these two files were handcrafted in a hex editor specifically to test these behaviors and the best documentation are the files themselves and he said this not laughing and it's ironic that he wrote it that way because yeah it was handcrafted on a hex editor so that you had the right characters at the right position and the file still opened as a as a compressed file and that takes effort and that takes preparation so oh, yeah. the the build script would look at those compressed files and take a character here, a character there, a character there, and compose the, the code, and then it would be compiled. And then through a facility by glibc called um, ifunc, which is indirect function, uh, they would be able to intercept function calls on, again, in this case, sshd, and inject their code into that process. This happens, again, complex chain. SSHD does not include Libel's AMA. The path that they used to make their code reachable to SSHD was specifically to systemd, to libsystemd, which includes Libel's AMA and which SSHD calls for some reporting functions that it uses. And through that chain of uh, different softwares is how they get their backdoor into SSHD. Not your run-of-the-mill compromise, not your run-of-the-mill backdoor. I, I know I'm repeating myself when I say this, but it really is. You're, underscore, you're underscoring this is what you're doing. You are underscoring this because of how much you actually need to underscore this because we need to because really understand what's happening here. Yeah, it's that bad. Because it's totally different from every supply chain attack that we've seen so far. This is by far miles ahead of any other in terms of sophistication and research and preparation. And again, yeah. this is the one we caught by accident. 
I, we so, need to be on high alert, everyone, right now. If you're a project maintainer and anything seems out of the ordinary, there's no harm in looking into it, right? Just, just if anything's out of place at this point, we got. I mean, I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom, but this kind of is, right? If this would have made it in there, as we've said many times already, this would have been a bigger deal than it already was. But then, what we don't know is if anyone else is trying this anywhere else. What we don't know, and I even hate to say this, is did anything, you know, actually get into something that we don't know about? Because either they're trying it because other people have failed and they want to be the first to get something in a back door or they're trying it because someone else succeeded and they're trying to match that. I have no idea. I don't have any reason to believe that there's any backdoors in Linux, but my point being that um, this isn't the last time we're going to talk about this and this isn't going to, going to be the last clever way someone tried to do this. And, and probably someone might not do it the same way next time if they're going to do it. But if you're a project maintainer, just keep your eyes open. And I know that's horrible to say because project maintainers are already stretched too thin as it is. So it's like asking you to be due diligence is, is asking for more work. The second thing is I just wish there was a way to shine some light on projects that need legitimate help. Like if your project is starving for people, I will absolutely mention it on this podcast. No question about it. If you're looking for people and you're having trouble keeping up with all the things you know, we got to start letting people know that what projects need help because sometimes they could get so desperate that the person they helped and there's no way they could have known this was themselves a backdoor. The attackers go so far as to disabling specific security features. There's a security facility that the kernel provides called Landlock, which lets which essentially locks down processes so that they cannot interact with other processes and manipulate it this way. So the way that they blocked this feature was that, again, through that specific tool chain path, they added a single dot to the make file, to, to a specific make file to make it always fail the compilation. By failing that compilation, the test to detect if land block was available or not would always return false. By always returning false, that specific part of XZ would never be compiled with land block enabled. Okay, that's right. how further ahead and how well prepared this was. A single dot was added to the CMake list. That's exceptionally difficult to spot even if you're reviewing the code with the utmost attention. After a few lines, I, you just don't notice an extra dot. I can't even find a single period in an hour when my code doesn't compile, and that's the only reason it doesn't, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's like um, always that one little character, and we can't even find it in our own code. Uh, but no, you're right. That That's just impossible to find just for that reason. It's just a little period and or whatever other character. I mean, how yes. many lines of code are we talking about here? <laughs> Quite a lot. Um, but there was people when they hear about the story, and this is what makes the, the news rounds and all the, the articles written about it will emphasize the 500 milliseconds delay that got the Microsoft engineer locking into it. And that's important, and that's what led to this being spotted. Mm -hmm. But to me, and I'm putting my tinfoil hat here on for a while, this is a symptom rather than the cause. Everything that happened in the XE project points that it was compromised and the back door was there and all of that. But at the tail end of the infection, when they were actually started to trying and getting the code accepted into the into the different distributions, and they started releasing version 5.6.0 of XZ, and then they started pressuring the Debian people to accepting it. And then they started pressuring Ubuntu into accepting it because the Debian people had already accepted it into unstable. And the same accounts that had been used two years prior came back from the dev, from the dev, and started pressuring the maintainers and the bug report that they had opened oh, yeah, the they Ubuntu did. project into accepting it again. Again, those accounts only exist for this. Yeah. Um, but at that point in time, when they were starting to get that, and they left the code in a state that it had a half a second of a delay to each SSHD connection, it leads me to believe that it was simply unoptimized. And one of the reasons that after an operation like this, where they put all the resources that they had into this and all the planning and all the effort into it, and they left the code in such a state that it would leave half a second delay, it feels rushed at the end. It feels like they were trying to meet a specific deadline. And one possible reason for this was that back in January, 
it had been started to be discussed in the in the system d project the removal of the dependency of libelzma if that dependency had been removed from the code then this entire operation would have been broken from the start it would no longer work they could no longer compromise sshd with their backdoor had the, the system d project removed that dependency then this would no longer work and it would have been two wasted years mm -hmm. and here's the funny thing the commit for removing that came out like two days the the request for accepting the commit that removes the dependency on libel zma by oh. system d came out like two days prior to the backdoor being actually deployed okay so, so are you thinking that they were just panicked because they felt like if they don't get it yeah. in there soon they're going to miss their opportunity and that's why it's absolutely. not optimized absolutely yeah that makes sense that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. absolutely yep. Mm -hmm. They were rushing things at the end. They were not willing to to accept that they had been wasted all this time into getting into the project with graces, into creating the code for something as complex as this, finding all the right people in the right places that would accept their code and would let it pass into the repositories. And then by a single commit on an unrelated project, everything would go down the drain. These right. guys went so far as to... Again, you cannot make this this type of things up. They added code to a Google project that, that has a security fuzzer that looks at the code on different projects and looking for security vulnerabilities. They added code that made that fuzzer from Google. They, add, they submitted the code to that project from Google that would make it ignore the parts of the code where the back door was on XZ. Oh, boy. Yeah, claiming that there would be an incompatibility and that it didn't need to be compiled that way because it wasn't relevant for the test and it might crash. Yeah, it might also comply that, complain that there's a backdoor there and you don't want to accept that code. So they went so far to adding code to other projects. And here's the thing. That specific account, that GA10 account, also made code submissions to LibArchive. LibArchive mm -hmm. is also a compression library, an unrelated project, which is now looking at all the commits that they accepted from that person. And they still haven't found anything. That doesn't mean that it isn't there, because given the level of sophistication of this, it's not something that you can just look at the code and spot. Okay, So it's possible that other projects have been compromised. It's also possible, and entirely possible, that the binary files that they deployed, where they picked the characters from, actually had um, further code that would be triggered from different scripts that they never got the opportunity to upload to the project. Um, yep. Again, so, really, really nasty stuff. It really is. I want to just highlight a comment by somebody in our chat room because I, I kind of feel like this is something that doesn't necessarily come up a lot, but it probably should because it's a really good question. Um, we will say, and you'll hear this, um, to say a threat actor from insert name of country did insert name of thing, right? Someone from a country did a thing. And when the media gets a hold of it, they're like, well, that country has a person doing bad things. So let's just say, for example, and this is why it's hard. Let's just say you, you have the news. I'll just pick a random country, China. Why not? Um, the, 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 let's just say the news has it in the media that uh, someone in China did a thing. And now people are taking it like China is bad. But when they look deeper, they might find that the actual person is from Wisconsin, for all we know. Just because the attack originated out of China doesn't mean China had anything to do with it. Um, just much of the same way if somebody hacks a company from their basement here in the United States, it doesn't mean the United States is to blame. It means that person is to blame. When you have a state-sponsored type thing, then that means a country more than likely is responsible. But at that point, there's still a question mark because... Nobody really wants to get caught. I don't care what side of this you're on. Like if you're doing something bad from your basement, right? Um, and no, obviously I'm not advocating for this, but if you're doing something bad, you're probably going to tunnel, tunnel your connection into a compromised computer somewhere else in another country. And then from that computer, you're, you're going to tunnel your computer over here, tunnel there, here, here, here. And then basically when it comes to getting caught, there's a subpoena chain that deep needed to get to the person at the other end, but the media hears a country and they just make it out like that country is um, to blame. And this is a very general thing I just wanted to get out there. In this case, um, when you have somebody contributed to, contributing to something, you might know where their internet connection came out of. 
And there might be other clues that might point to a country, but that's just kind of like an explanation. It's not always easy to know exactly where something came from because of how many times a connection could be tunneled among other things that could be in between us and the person. That's that's absolutely true. But we do know something. A two-year long operation is not something that is done by a specific, just a lone individual. That doesn't right. happen. Right. The amount of effort doesn't pay off. It, there are easier ways to get the payout of, of doing ransomware, for example. It, it doesn't oh, yeah. pay to go to all this hassle. No. Ransomware groups, on the other hand, which are also a big threat right now, they don't go for operations as long as this. First, because they have to be maintained. Second, because the level of preparation and sophistication of the attack far exceeds anything that we've ever seen from the, the ransomware group so far, even with their economic models and them having HR departments and all of that. And the specificity of the attack and the code that was created and how broad it was, I mean, the, the, the intended target being all the Red Hat based systems, all the Debian based systems out there, that's mind blowing. That's the majority of the Linux ecosystem out there. They were oh, yeah. going to target every single Linux distribution installation and future installation at the same time with this. Right. If this doesn't make you think twice about cybersecurity, I really don't know what does. Because this is as close as we could have been as having a global backdoor on every single Linux system out there. And yeah. we caught it entirely by blind luck. Yep. Again, cannot stress that enough. Yeah, and yeah, in this case, just to underscore what you're saying. There, there's no way, you know. I've, of course, I joke about Wisconsin is right next door, so I, I'm allowed to joke about it. No one else can, but me, apparently. Just okay. Anyway, I'll stop piling on Wisconsin, like somebody said in their chat room. But um, when you have a situation like this, and and, and to underscore what you're, what you're saying, there comes a point where it's pretty much impossible for it to be one person. Then there comes a point where it's absolutely impossible for it to be one person when you start thinking about the number of lines of codes and I mean, codes, I mean, code and all these different things that just becomes too much for one person. I mean, think about a project like XZ itself is too much for one person at this point. So there's, okay, so there is a limit to what we could do as one person, but when you have something that's so architected so well and it's so big and it takes so many years and it's so specific, it's it's at that point, yeah, that I, we, we start to look at the point of possibility of it being a single person as pretty much non-existent in yeah. this case. Remember when I mentioned Landlock before? Landlock is a security feature that you get from the kernel and from most distributions. It's, it's active, it's either Landlock or some other comparable alternatives, like you have SE Linux on Red Hats and you have App Armor. it's the same for Landlock. Mm -hmm. um, interesting thing, the Landlock protection that they deployed would only affect XZ itself, not LibLZMA. So what we caught was not the entire exploit, was not everything that they were trying to do, because the exploit right now is on LibLZMA. What was identified is on LibLZMA, but that protection feature that they had added was for XZ specifically, not LibLZMA, even if it was part of right. the same package. Okay, that's important to keep in mind because we might not have caught everything that was supposed to happen with this. Additionally, there are lots of other processes that link directly to the system D, just the same way that SSHD does. Um, we don't know with absolute, with absolute certainty that SSHD was the only target process here. We don't know if they weren't trying to, to hit something else. Um, there is one detail with the commits that added the, the binary files that some people pointed to and some other people then disparaged and said that it doesn't really matter because those things can be forged. The commits with the binary files were not the only ones, but two out of three or four different commits out of a few dozen that happened like on a time zone that was seven hours different from the same time zone that he usually logged in from. There was this time zone difference there. Mm -hmm. Now, other people obviously pointed out that uh, Git dates and Git time can be forged. You can just edit that with the text editor and put whatever you want there. Mm -hmm. If you look at the map and if you look at the time zones in China and you move your your time zone seven hours in one direction, seven hours in the other, 
you will find some interesting conflict areas right now. Okay, which I'll refrain from mess from mentioning because the algorithm doesn't really like it. Um, you, there was a possibility that the account, the GA10 account, had been compromised rather than actually being responsible. But then, when you look at all the other things that happened simultaneously, the different accounts pressuring in the the way that it got the the privileges in the project, the way that it committed other code to other projects, and all of that, that possibility was ruled out. Okay, but. I thought it was yeah. important to raise because it was something that was discussed at length for in the, the days after the this was made public. If I remember correctly, wasn't it the consensus that whoever it was was speaking too intelligently about what they were talking about to because I, I know one thing is when but someone's an imposter in a project, yeah. they you know yeah. might 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 obviously seem out of place, but that this person in conversations were they were using the right lingo and everything, like somebody who was seasoned in the industry which is probably another reason why they didn't think anything because he's been there for or that person's been there for a while they put in the effort they yeah. were there they put in, in the, the effort to learn it and, and that yeah. can't be faked is basically what yeah. i'm saying you can't fake experience being you know working with people you know there's there's it's just not how it goes another thing and this is a personal pet peeve of mine since i spent some time a few years ago trying to debug send my cf files that are written in m4 which is the same language that the, the build scripts for the distributions are written in. That language is atrocious. M4 should be taken to the backyard and dealt with quickly and taken out. Oh, it um, will be as soon as Apple releases the M4 and they find out something has its name. It'll be taken care of. Don't worry about it. Okay, I, I joke, I joke. Anyway. That's atrocious. And it's for someone that's... A C developer can pick up Python and can pick up Rust with relative ease. I know this is obviously subjective and people will have different tastes and will be faster at learning some different things. Right. The majority of people that I'm familiar with, that I've spoken at length with about different languages and computer languages, it's always easier to explain concepts from Python and Rust to a C developer and a C++ developer than it is to explain the same concepts touching on M4 to other developers. Because it's so arcane, the, the syntax is horrible, um, it's very easy to make mistakes, and it's really hard to actually read the code if you're not familiar with M4 already. Mm -hmm. The way that the code was written on the build scripts that tailored this and that allowed this and enabled this backdoor to be deployed, first it was written in M4, so it immediately shut out a whole lot of reviewers from actually being able to, to understand the code and spot that something weird was there. And then it's so arcane that even if you look at the, the, the malicious code right in front of you, you would still be hard pressed to spot it. Um, it might just be me that absolutely hate that language, but yeah, most people have a hard time being able to read it. Why the hell are we still using it? I mean, bash scripts at this moment would be easier and faster to deploy than this. Don't even get us started on code and, and all these. <laughs> yeah. We have opinions as a, as a, we as we all do. But yeah. So, yeah, I think at this point, it's just a cautionary tale, but I just really feel like people just need to pay attention to this and it's like we don't need any more examples okay like i'm all for having content to talk about on the um podcast but at this point it's like is this going to be the supply chain <laughs> podcast or you know I, I joke but this is such a common thing trying to get these things in there and i just worry that eventually it will so i need everyone to just you know something seems out of place just look at it at least and the thing is in the cybersecurity sphere or the cybersecurity bubble, whatever you want to call it, we're used at dealing with threats at this high. And this is like twice that height and nobody was looking so far high. And nobody was expecting right. something with this level of complexity. And that's why stuff like this can fly essentially above the radar, not under, uh, in my analogy. But when the threats get as complex as this, it means that less people are able to to spot them and are able to effectively fight them. We owe this Microsoft engineer that found the, the, the thing. We should really thank the guy. We dodged the yeah. bullet. We collectively dodged the bullet on this one, specifically because that person found it. Or else we would all have backdoors in our systems. Right. Again, we cannot yep. underscore this. This is the by far the most 
widespread target and the most widespread damage that we have all almost been hit with. We've narrowly missed this one, we dodged the bullet here. We don't know how long the, the luck will continue because we just know about the ones that we caught, not the ones that have already been deployed. And if and again, my this this is a permanent offer. If any project out there is hurting for people and just wants to be mentioned to get some additional people on the project, I will always mention it um, because I just feel like we need to get the word out there. And that's the least I can do is just see if there's anyone in my audience that can help someone. But more than often than not, I mean, we just got to see what we can do to make these projects not so starved all the time because it's just too common. We see, wait, there's how many people behind this library that's super important that major data centers all over the world are relying on and you have how many people working on it again? That's just not okay. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is yet, but projects being starved is absolutely not it. It's called the bus factor. Most projects have a bus factor of one, meaning that if one person gets hit by a bus, the project dies. So a bus factor, okay. The okay. bus factor. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's the the term that is often used to describe that. Um, yeah, I guess we covered the majority of the story. I have a few more details on the blog post. So if you guys want to, to look it up, a deep dive on the XE compromise, it's on the TaxCare blog. Thank you very much for hearing me rant about XE for almost an hour. Um, thank you, Jay, for letting me hog all the, <laughs> the air waves on this one. Um, as always, it was a pleasure doing this with you. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you. And until then, that's that's been your ABCs of the XZ problem. See you around next time. Bye.